You're watching a message from Redbud Baptist Church featuring Pastor Carlos and Ojos. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. We have two services, 9 a.m. service called Traditions and a more modern worship at 1111 a.m. we like to call Bridge. We're a going church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. Now we're going to invite anyone to church on a Sunday morning. Certainly I would do it for every Sunday because I think every Sunday is the Lord's Day, and I think that uh, every Sunday we should invite somebody to come to church. But if I were to invite somebody to come to church, and if I had a choice, and if I was told you can only invite them to one, I would invite them to the Sunday when the Lord gets together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Because it is the most, one of the most powerful messages that we can ever speak in, an, in a church setting. To show you that, I want to invite you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to read one verse, verse 26. And I want you to think, think long and hard on this verse. If you made your way there, please stand with me one more time as we read God's Word, if you're able to, um, and then we'll pray. This is what this verse says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that this verse would grip our hearts today. Lord, help us to understand that by participation, we are making a proclamation. We are saying something. Our actions are speaking very loud. And for that reason, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we here in this room today would take to heart that participating in the Lord's Supper is more than just a ritual, way more than just a practice. It is a proclamation of a truth that is found in your word, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you help us to understand that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. As you know, I don't necessarily preach an entire sermon um, when we take the Lord's Supper because I believe that the Lord's Supper in and of itself, if we do it right and speak right, it'll, it'll tell us a message. And every time that I come to celebrate the Lord's Supper with you, I try to point out something of the Lord's Supper that we need to remember. After all, we do it to remember. And so I think it's important. I find it interesting that Paul in this passage says that as often as you do this, eat the bread and drink the cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, what I find interesting is, why didn't he say the resurrection? Or why didn't he say the cross? I don't believe Paul is ignoring those two. It's we preach the cross, or we try to anyway, all the time, preach the cross. Jesus died on the cross. He went to the cross. He came to go to the cross. And then he was buried. And we preach that he resurrected, that he's alive, that he ascended back into heaven, and he's with the Heavenly Father waiting to come back. We preach that all the time. But why would Paul want us to remember something that is so painful? Now, we had two memorial services this week, and, uh, and there were several deaths throughout the week related to church members, not all here. Um, and, and, and so, in a way, death surrounded us, right? If, if you think about it that way, we were surrounded by death this week. 
And so, why would Paul want us to remember that? Well, as I, as I read the Scriptures and I thought about why death, I came up with an acrostic that I want to give you using the word death to help you remind or to help remind you and me of the things that are involved in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, it's not just his death. It's he went to the cross, he did die, and he was buried, and on the third day he resurrected. That's the gospel. That's what we preach and all that. But, but what do we need to remember about his death? And so let me give those to you by first uh, telling you that if, if you're taking notes this morning, the letter D simply reminds us of it is done. It is done. Jesus on the cross in John chapter 19 and verse 30 said this, when, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. What did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? I, I believe that it means this. It means that what he came to do was done. It was fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled everything that the plan of God had already mentioned. It was fulfilled. It is finished. It is complete. Done. There's nothing more to add to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this important? Because there are hundreds and thousands of people, even people who come to church every Sunday, who believe that they got to do something else, some, some more thing, just a little bit more to make sure, to guarantee that I get in, even if it's by the hair on my chinny chin chin, right? And they're hoping and praying and thinking and wondering many times, uh, did, did I do enough? Was I good enough? Would I, did I serve enough? Did I, do I need to do more? What else can I do? And if you're referring to your salvation, may I remind you today that you can add nothing to the work of Jesus Christ that'll help you. Think about that. You, can, you, you yourself, by your deeds and your works and your goodness and all of that stuff, can add nothing to what Jesus did on the cross to save you. When he said it is finished, he meant it is done, it is complete. Remember the word done. Or if you prefer, use the biblical term it is finished. But what about the letter E? The letter E, I would give you this word, eternity. Eternity. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. What does paradise mean? Well, there's a lot of interpretation about what paradise means. The word paradise comes from an, uh, uh, the origin of a Persian word, which means enclosure, or it means garden or park. Park is like you and I know park, right? Garden or park or some kind of enclosure. And this word is only found three times in the New Testament. It is found here in this verse and in two other locations. The Apostle Paul uses it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and there it is clearly synonymous with heaven. And then the second reference is found in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. There the word paradise spoken of is where the tree of life is, and clearly a reference to the third heaven Paul referenced in Corinthians. And so in those two places, the word paradise is synonymous with the word heaven. And so, but when Jesus spoke this word, when he said, use paradise here, he had not yet died, obviously, and he had not yet been buried, and he had not yet resurrected. So what did he mean to the, 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 the thief on the cross when he said, today you shall be with me in paradise? Well, I believe that uh, Jesus was referring to Sheol, to the Jews, uh, or Hades, to the Greeks, and Sheol was a dividing, divided into the Gehenna, the place of torment, and Paradise, the place of the righteous dead, or as Jesus referred to it in Luke 16, 22 and 23, as Abraham's bosom. 
But here's the point that I would like to make to you today. Whatever you believe about that, here's what the point that I would like to make to you today. And that is that whatever paradise is, and wherever paradise is, Jesus is present. And those who believe in him are there also, and we get to proclaim that. Amen? Amen? And so I, I don't want us to get caught up in all of that, that, that we forget the point. And the point is that Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me. Wherever Jesus went, whatever that location was, whatever it looked like, whatever it smelled like, Jesus said, today you will be with me there. And Jesus says to all of us that we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ and to top it off, the Lord, we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever, for eternity. And so that's the word eternity. Remember the word eternity. Remember the word access. The word access. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, Paul wrote these words. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Do you see that? We both have access by one spirit to the Father. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible reminds us of this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's what we need to remember. As children of God, as believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, not only will we spend eternity with God in heaven or wherever Jesus may be, but we have access to the throne of God by one spirit. All of us do. It's not just the preachers or the evangelists or whomever we may think. All of us have access to the very God that Jesus, uh, the, the Heavenly Father that Jesus prayed to every time he prayed. You have as much, as a child of God, you have as much access to the throne of God as anyone else. Amen? Amen. And so we have access to our Heavenly Father. One of the many privileges disciples of Jesus have is to access our Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that reason, the writer of Hebrews encourages us to come boldly, to come boldly to the presence of God. May I remind you today, never hesitate to come boldly to the presence of our Heavenly Father. He wants you to. He is waiting for you to come. He is not intimidated by whatever you may present before Him. He is not concerned if you show up with doubts or struggles or frustrations or any of those things. God is not intimidated by that. Deuteronomy chapter 4, the verse that I read to you a while ago, He is God in the heaven above and on earth below. He is God everywhere. He is sovereign. He's in control. He's not intimidated or afraid of anything. Come, because you have access. And then let me give you the word triumph. The word triumph. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 tells us this. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and, throughout, and, and, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Man, I wish I had time to preach on that. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Let me just say this. Have you ever sat beside somebody and it is obvious the perfume, perfume or the cologne that they are wearing? <laughs> I have some really good ones that I've been given over the years, and uh, I, I don't use them a lot, but I use them occasionally. And, uh, but, but, but I'm, I'm always, I'm always, uh, uh, I always laugh when, when somebody walks into the room, and man, I'm telling you, they made their praise. They have the fragrance. You know what I'm talking about? You know what Paul says about the triumphs? that we get in Jesus Christ, that when you show up, 
because of the victories that you gain in Jesus Christ, you diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge. Church, I want to tell you something. The world desperately needs Christians out there in the world who give off a fragrance unlike any other fragrance, and that's the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why you go through trials. That's why you go through temptations. That's why you go through those things, because in the working of all of that in Christ Jesus, the victory and the triumph that God gives you in all of that is a fragrance like no other fragrance. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and, and through 39, Paul wrote these words, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered, up, de delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Triumph. Remember that word, triumph. According to one writer, the phrase in Christ or with Christ is used 138 times in the New Testament to describe our state because of Jesus. Notice in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians, it is God who leads us in triumph in Christ. No wonder Paul in Romans says that we are more than conquerors who loved, uh, through him who loved us. And then let me give you the last word. I love this word. The word hope. Hope. Let me read to you another long passage. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you, uh, whom ha having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The disciples' faith is one of living hope. Of this hope, Peter says in chapter 3 of 1 Peter and verse 15, these words, that when we are asked, we must give a response to the hope that is in you. And as another writer put it, our statement is simple. That Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh, died that we might have eternal life. Amen? Amen. So, let me finish with these words. As you participate today in the Lord's Supper, 
Remember that you are proclaiming the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are acknowledging that he did die. You are proclaiming that he died for a reason, the payment and the ultimate forgiveness of our sin. You are declaring that he was buried in a tomb, properly sealed and heavily guarded around the clock by capable Roman soldiers. You are professing that on the third day, just like he said he would, he resurrected out of that grave, is alive today, and is coming back soon. His death means done. It means eternity. It means access. It means triumph. And it means hope. That is what we mean when we talk about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, church, this morning, I would like for you to join me as we observe the Lord's Supper and declare and proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite you, the men, to come, our men who are going to help us serve this morning. If you will come and take your place, and I will join you there. The Bible says that on the, day, on the night, the evening that the Lord celebrated the Feast of Passover, he took bread and he broke it. And we will do the same today.
And that night, our Lord took the cup. And the Bible says that he gave thanks as well. The fruit of the vine represents the blood of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. It's an impossibility. No other payment would have been sufficient. No amount of works would have worked. The only work that worked was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And when he came out of that grave, that satisfied all. The fruit of the vine represents the blood of the Lord Jesus that was shed. Let's give thanks. And Heavenly Father, we come to you again. It was impossible for us, your creation, to work up anything that would have even remotely been sufficient. We could not have satisfied the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the condemnation that we faced because of our sin. And because you loved us first and Jesus died for us, we have redemption. We have salvation. We have hope. We have a place to go. And it is for eternity. Father, we can't help this morning but to say thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says that they did drink. As I look out into congregation this morning, I'm hopeful that everyone who is here today knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But if you don't, today would be a good day to just say yes to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you of your sin, and he will. Invite him to come be your savior, and he will. Ask him to give you hope, and he will. If you haven't done that, do it today. But for those of you who may be watching online, maybe you haven't come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never made that decision. Let me speak to you for just a second. Just because you're not in the room, and may not have participated doesn't mean that you can't have a part of Jesus today. The Bible says that if you'll confess your sin to him and ask him to forgive you of it and you'll repent of it, he'll save you. If you invite him to come and be your Lord and believe in him with all of your heart, he'll do that. And so I'm going to ask the crowd here this morning and you in the, in the audience to bow your head right now and just pray for those of you who are saved. Would you just pray for anybody who might need to give their life to Jesus Christ? And if you're online or maybe in the room and you've never given your life to Jesus, may I lead you in a prayer that I think will help you get to where you need to be. Pray this prayer to the Heavenly Father and mean it with all your heart. God in heaven, I know that I need a Savior. I know that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. I repent of my sin today, and I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe that he resurrected just like he said he did. And I believe in him as my Lord and my Savior right now. Lord Jesus, would you come 
and save me today. If you prayed that, in just a moment, I'm going to tell you what you need to do next. Don't walk away from Jesus. He came to save you. On the screen, you'll see a phone number. And it says, text LIFE to that number. Do it right now. If you prayed that prayer, do it right now. Just text LIFE to that number right there. Follow the instructions. Tell us how to get a hold of you. And we will reach out to you. All you have to say is, Pastor, I prayed the prayer. What do I do next? Just do that. And we'll meet you where you are. And we'll pray with you. And we'll help you out. Lord, thank you for this service today. I thank you for every person in this room. What a blessing it is to be among God's people. I want to sing a song just for a minute. Would you stand with us and let's sing this? Do you have a song, Ron? If God spoke to your heart, you need prayer, make your way here. If you can't make your way here, maybe you can just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need prayer. Anybody need prayer this morning? Let's sing.